All right. So I did get a couple of good questions for y'all um, last time uh, about different retinas of different creatures. And I thought I would go ahead and share those with you. So the first thing that I did when I walked in the door when I got home last night was I looked this up on my phone and I thought I would share this with you. So, um, so Sarah had a question about bats. And one of the things that they actually believed that bats used to be able to do, they thought that bats only had rods, that bats could not see in color. I actually pulled up an article from 29th, oh, that is birds. We need the one on bats. Um, so first of all, bats are not blind. So I know we have that saying, blind is a bat. Bats actually are not blind. Um, as I kind of mentioned, it was very recently believed up until maybe about 15 years ago that bats were, you know, they didn't see color and that they were blind, but it actually turns out, um, so I pulled this up, this is from October 2018, um, a new study uh, has examined this question in the evolution of color vision genes across a large and diverse group of bat species. Some bats that have the most advanced type of echolocation appear to have traded UV for exquisite hearing. So for bats that don't really do a lot of echolocation, they, um, for bats that don't do a lot of echolocation, they can actually see UV. Um, let me see. So some can actually see certain types of colors. Um, so that would make a lot of sense if you were something like a fruit bat. Fruit bats probably need to be able to see in color a little bit just because their, their diet requires them to be able to notice the different colors of different types of fruits. I would say large flying foxes. And if you haven't seen flying foxes, they're super cute. Um, they also rely on a diet of fruit. So they're gonna need to be able to see color a little bit and they are capable of seeing UV. However, bats that rely more on sonar and echolocation, they're probably not going to have as good color ability because it's basically a trade-off between vision and hearing for bats. Now, I mentioned, um, I did get some questions about bird retinas too. So I actually pulled up an article from Purdue from 2019 that actually found that some species, most birds actually have four cone photoreceptors. They actually have four in addition to those colored oil drops that I mentioned that allow them to see color clearly. They have a fifth cone for achromatic tasks and a rod for dim light vision. So birds actually have more cones than you or I do. And some species of birds can also see ultraviolet. So I wanted to follow up and share those with you. Um, if you find anything, if you find anything particularly interesting about animals and vision, please feel free to share those with me and with the rest of the class. This is definitely a class where you can ask the kind of questions, can bats see what you or I see? Okay. So we last left off talking about the different cone receptors. And I showed you an image that's basically, these are dyed, just so we're clear. These have been uh, manipulated so that you can see red, green, and blue cones. Just as a friendly reminder, red cones are not actually the color red, blue cones are not the color blue, and green cones are not the color green. Also, for the purposes of this class, you are frequently going to hear me refer to these as, uh-oh, oh, we're doing that again, are we? Okay. Um, you're going to hear me refer to these as short cones, medium cones, and long cones. And remember, uh, something we'll talk about a bit more when we get into color vision is that red cones, so-called red cones, don't just respond to red. 
They can respond to blue or green as well, but they're going to be maximally sensitive to red. So something to keep in mind. So let's talk about the process of photoactivation and what happens when light actually hits these photoreceptors. So I'm gonna go to the back really quick and close the door because I know I'm being really loud. <laughs> I was in this, I was walking by the student lounge the other day and I I was talking with Dr. Quinn and I said something like I feel like I could be really loud here. Am I loud? And some of the students looked at me and nodded a little bit. You've got that theater kid energy. They taught me to project and I never really learned how to stop. All right, so let's talk about what happens when uh, light actually hits um, the photoreceptors. Now remember, uh, just going back really quick so that you can see this. So remember that the outer, seg the outer segment actually has a component that's called a chromophore. The chromophore is there to capture photons. Remember, light is a particle. It is also a wave. And the photoreceptors, I took my coat off. I'm cold. I'm putting it back on. Um, the outer segments contain a chromophore, and that's basically there to capture those photons, those particles of light. So the process of photoactivation begins when light hits our photoreceptors. Now, for those of you who have had me for biopsych, I'm going to bring back something you might remember. Uh, photoreceptors are depolarized in the dark, so they become less negatively charged in the dark, and they become more uh, they become more negatively charged or hyperpolarized in the light. So when a photon makes contact with that outer segment, that's photoactivation. The photoreceptors are going to be hyperpolarized. They actually become more negative than they already are. And remember, photoreceptors do not fire action potentials. These are neurons, but they're going to send glutamate to bipolar cells. That glutamate is going to indicate that light just increased. Now, neurons, when we talk about neurons firing action potentials, you might have heard me talk about the fact that they fire all or none. Um, just to kind of give you a reminder about what this is, the action potential in a neuron is when the voltage of a neuron shifts from negative 70 up to about positive 40, and that travels down the axon. And the thing is, if it's not strong enough to trigger an action potential, it's not going to happen. So that's why we call it all or none. It's like flushing a toilet. If you put your hand on the handle to flush the toilet and you don't do it hard enough, the toilet is not going to flush. But if you flush it hard enough, it will always flush the exact same way, regardless of what method that you do. So photoreceptors don't do this, though. They fire what they basically communicate with something called a graded potential. That means if there's more light, they're going to release more glutamate. If there's less light, they're going to release less glutamate. So the amount of glutamate that the photoreceptors send to those bipolar cells varies based on how much activation there is. The more activation, the more the glutamate. The less activation, the less the glutamate. All right. Does anybody need some more time here? Okay. So the photoreceptors release glutamate onto bipolar cells when there's light. And then the photoreceptors are going to communicate with those bipolar cells. So bipolar cells, we're not going to go into a lot of detail about on or off cells. We're not really going to worry about that here. 
but the bipolar cells are going to communicate with ganglion cells through those same graded potentials that we saw with the photoreceptors. So again, the amount of glutamate that the bipolar cells release onto the ganglion cells depends on how active they are. So the more activity, the more glutamate will be released onto the ganglion cell. And then the ganglion cells, they're the only cells that we're gonna talk about in the retina that actually fire action potentials. And they do so in an all or none fashion. Just a quick reminder, it is the axons of the ganglion cells that form the optic nerve. So the optic nerve is made up of ganglion cell axons. Remember that this is being recorded. I will give you the link to this tomorrow. I will not record all the time. However, I have a YouTube channel. I have ballparking at about 876 subscribers. I'm sure most of them are bots, but apparently somebody's watching this. <laughs> so I don't really mind. Okay. So I wanna talk a little bit more about bipolar cells in detail. And again, we're not really gonna talk about on and off bipolar cells here. However, I wanna talk about two different types that are gonna be really important when we talk about the different things that our visual system does, like looking at color, looking for motion, registering object form. Um, so what you can see here in this figure, here we have our photoreceptors, and then they're going to connect to those bipolar cells. Um, so one of the things that you'll notice is that sometimes you are going to have the bipolar cells connecting to more than one photoreceptor. And that's especially going to be true if we're talking about rods. Remember that rods have high convergence. That means that a bipolar cell is gonna be talking with a lot of different rods. So you can see here in this, fig in this figure that the bipolar cells are communicating with more than one rod. Now look at something like cones. In this case, we have one bipolar cell making contact with one cone. That doesn't always happen, but remember that cones have low convergence. That means that one bipolar cell is making contact with as few as one cone or a very small number of cones. Um, so there are two different types of bipolar cells. And I already mentioned these a little bit on Tuesday, but we have our diffuse bipolar cells. They're gonna get input from multiple photoreceptors and folks, if you're getting input from multiple photoreceptors, those are probably gonna be rods. Now compare that to our midget bipolar cell. So this would be an example of a midget cell. It is making contact with one single cone. Did you have a question, Sarah? You were just stretching. Okay, sorry. Okay, does anybody need some more time here? Okay, so let's talk about the connections that those diffuse and midget bipolar cells, those connections that they make with ganglion cells. So what you're looking at here are different types of ganglion cells. So first, we're gonna talk about what are called P ganglion cells. They're, they're over here. And as you can see, they're pretty small. Sometimes they are also called midget cells. Um, so P ganglion cells get their input from midget bipolar cells. Now we're gonna talk about two major pathways for vision. We're gonna talk about a parvocellular pathway and what's called a magnocellular pathway. 
Um, so in this case, the midget bipolar cells make contact with P ganglion cells, which connect to our parvocellular pathway. The parvocellular pathway is critical for different facets of objects, such as fine detail. So being able to look at an object's texture, it's also going to process color, and it's also going to process that object's form. Now, I've mentioned that there are two pathways. Um, it turns out that there's actually a third pathway that we know a little, a little less well. So we have our parvocellular pathway. On the next slide, we're gonna talk about our magnocellular pathway. And then there's a third pathway that's called the coniocellular pathway. That's conio with a K, which is kind of different. Um, we know a little less about the coniocellular pathway at this point. So then we have our M ganglion cells. And you can see that the M ganglion cells tend to be a lot larger. Notice that whereas our P ganglion cells are referred to as midget cells, notice that our, um, our M ganglion cells are referred to as parasols. They have a nice big branching structure. Um, so M ganglion cells get their input from diffuse bipolar cells. So whereas our P ganglion cells are getting input from midget bipolar cells, and thus they're getting a lot of information from cones, M ganglion cells are getting a lot of their information from rods. So in this case, the M ganglion cells are going to connect to what is called the magnocellular pathway. This pathway is really critical for spatial processing, specifically motion processing, which is something that's largely driven by rods rather than cones. Everybody good? So here's just another image that you can see. Um, and one of the other things that I'll kind of just show you in this figure, we're not going to go into too much detail about this, but some, some bipolar cells um, are especially stimulated when light is on. Other ones get especially stimulated because light is off. So those of you that had me for biopsych, you might remember me talking about on and off bipolar cells. Um, but what you really need to know here is that our photoreceptors always respond one way. They always are depolarized in the dark and they're hyperpolarized by light. Once we get to bipolar and ganglion cells, we're starting to get more complex. These cells, both bipolar and ganglion cells, have separate divisions based on light increasing or light decreasing. So here we have two P ganglion cells in this case. One is signifying that light's increased. We have another one that can signify when light is off. And then we find the same thing being true for our M ganglion cells. This one indicates when light has increased. This one indicates when light has turned off. So we're starting to get more complex in our processing, going from the photoreceptors to the bipolar cells to the ganglion cells. But we have a few other cells in our retina that we need to talk about. Everything that I've been talking about so far is a vertical pathway. We go from the photoreceptors to the bipolar cells, to the ganglion cells and the optic nerve, and then we're going to the brain. But we do have a horizontal pathway that is designed to create inhibition. And this also serves an important function. So the retina also contains two different layers of cells in the horizontal plane. We have what are called horizontal cells, 
and we have what are called amacrine cells. Now, to be completely honest with you, we don't really know that much about what amacrine cells do, but we know a little bit more about what horizontal cells do. Horizontal cells make contact with both photoreceptors and bipolar cells. So kind of going back to uh, our previous picture. So here's our photoreceptors, here's our uh, bipolar cells, here is a horizontal cell making contact with several bipolar cells. So the reason that you would want to have this horizontal structure is that the horizontal cells have a very inhibitory structure. So for you to be able to separate objects from their background, for you to be able to notice where the boundary of one object ends and another begins, you can't have all of the areas of your retina active at the same time. If I want to be able to differentiate my Diet Mountain Dew from my Stanley Cup, I need to figure out where the edges of objects are. That means contrast. That means lines. That means dark places, not light. So the horizontal cells are basically going to create what is called lateral inhibition. And I'm gonna pick on the second row because there's three of them sitting right in front of me. So imagine that you three are photoreceptors. Jenna is active. Jenna has light. I'm a horizontal, I'm basically, and then here we have Lauren, who's basically the bipolar self. So you're all making contact with Lauren right now. Lauren's going to carry on that message. However, I am a bipolar, I am a horizontal cell. I am basically going to send inhibition to Lauren, and I'm going to send inhibition to Lauren so that both of you aren't active the same time that Jen is active. So basically, I'm going to send inhibition to neighboring areas of the retina so that I can figure out things like edges and contours and contrast and things like that. So this helps create receptive fields. Receptive fields are basically areas of our visual field which when something falls into that receptive field, that cell is gonna fire. Like I said, we don't really know that much about what amacrine cells do. So when the bipolar cells make contact with our ganglion cells, the amacrine cells have a very similar horizontal function, but we don't really know much about what they do. We do know that they further enhance some of that contrast for you to notice edges, there have to be some shifts in light and dark for you to notice edges of objects. And we also know that the amacrine cells might note changes in the patterns of light over time. But beyond that, we don't really know that much about what they do. All right, does anybody need some more time here? Maybe a little bit? Okay. I don't mean to rush ya. How much caffeine is in that Celsius drink, Dylan? Is it bad? I was going to say, I was going to say, I, I I didn't realize, I'm like, it's a little tiny can. How much can it have? And I'm like, oh yeah, I'm never drinking one of those. Okay. 12 ounce can. 68 milligrams. I could drink three. I could drink three of these and still not meet the amount of caffeine that is in that can. <laughs> Take it easy. Be careful. I don't really need to drink all of them. I heard I too many, them. I've heard too many scary stories about the Panera le lemonade. So now I'm just scared. This is less than lemonade. Well, that's good. Mm. Oh my gosh. That's just wrong. Okay, 
All right. So let's talk a little bit about the, the importance of receptive fields. I know, scintillating topics. Okay, so I kind of defined this before, but if you want a clearer um, definition of what a receptive field is, a receptive field is basically the region on the retina where a stimulus, if it's present, will influence a neuron's firing rate. So how do we figure out receptive fields? So this is a pretty famous study that was done. One of the things that you can do is you can take an animal, you can basically put micro electrodes in different parts of the brain or in the retina, and you can shine lights in differing amounts and actually get a single cell recording of whether or not that cell fires. So this is a pretty classic setup. So we record a signal from the optic nerve. You have to make sure that the animal is awake and behaving, otherwise this won't work. And you're basically going to present the animal with different visual stimuli. You don't want these stimuli to be too complex. You're probably gonna look at spots of light of varying sizes. And you can record how that optic nerve fires in real time. So Kuffler, using a very, oh, do y'all need me to go back? Okay, so Kuffler basically did a very similar sort of setup to this and mapped out the receptive fields of individual ganglion cells in cats. So they did this with cats, which actually sounds kind of fun because hanging out with cats is fun. Some of you are like, no. Um, but what I want you to notice, so here's kind of what this looks like. Based on the responses that the optic nerve made, Coupler was able to basically show that ganglion cells, and remember, we're only talking about ganglion cells here because they're the only ones that fire action potentials. Ganglion cells basically have this nice center surround structure. It is circular in nature. There is a circular center followed by a larger surround. Um, and you can kind of see how this is made. So our center comes from a photoreceptor. Our surround comes from those horizontal connections between the photoreceptors. So we have that, um, we have that center structure, that, and in this case, it's excitatory. That means if you fire right here, it's going to excite the neuron. If you fire here in its inhibitory area in the surround, you are going to get less firing. You're going to get more inhibition. So we have this center surround structure that's created partially through the photoreceptors and then those horizontal cells engaging in lateral inhibition. This information is gonna make contact with the bipolar cell which is then going to activate that particular ganglion cell. That ganglion cell will then fire based on that center surround structure. So there are two different types of ganglion cells that we're gonna talk about here. And I know in biopsych, we call them on and off, but I'm gonna try to make this a little easier for you to remember. So we have what are called on-center cells and we have what are called off-center cells. So on-center cells look like this. The center is an excitatory region. If you shine light here, it is going to excite the cell and firing is going to increase. Now notice it has what we call an off surround. That means that if you shine light in the surround, you're going to get some inhibition and the cell is going to fire less. Now, quick, quick little pop quiz question. I want to see if anybody knows. What if I shine a light that envelops the entire cell, both center and surround? What do you think? 
So if I have a light that includes both the center and the surround, what's going to happen? Any thoughts? Is there a dog barking? Okay. Okay. If you shine a light that covers both the center and the surround, it, it won't turn on at all because you'll have excitation from this, but it'll be canceled out by the inhibition and the surround. So if you shine a light that envelops the whole thing, you don't really see a lot of change because the excitation and the inhibition cancel each other out. Now, we also have what are called off-center cells. In this case, if I shine a light in the surrounding area, I get excitation. If I shine light in the center, I get inhibition. You need to have both of these types present because this is the beginning of how we see edges, contours, motion, and so on. All of those things are due to changes in contrast. And these two different types of ganglion cells are here to basically help you with contrast. Yeah, Dylan. Um, so like for people that are like blind or have trouble like seeing them, but have like really bad eyesight, mm -hmm. are these cells in their eyes like not red for some reason or? Well, people can have eye problems for a variety of different reasons. So it all really depends on what's been damaged. So I think for a lot of people, if especially if they have retinal damage. So if you have something like macular degeneration, um, I don't even think it's feasible to talk about what the on and off center cells do, because if you have macular degeneration, your photoreceptors are dead. Like they're not working. There's no light to register. So if you have that big center blindness that we'll talk about a little more due to your um, your fovea being damaged, you're not going to get any activation in your ganglion cells in the first place because the photoreceptors are effectively dead and can't make that input. Um, if we're talking about cortical damage. So if you damage your primary visual cortex, these are processing, but you're probably not going to be conscious that they're being processed. So we have a phenomenon that's known as blind sight. So we have people who have damage to their primary visual cortex. For all intents and purposes, they're blind. If you shine a light in their eye, and you say, do you see a light I shined? They're gonna tell you no. However, if you ask them to guess where the light is, they do better than guessing. And that's because even though the primary visual cortex is damaged, there's still primitive visual systems in areas like the pulvinar nucleus that are still accounting for that. For you to be able to have blind sight, you gotta have these. So it really depends on where the locus of damage is. Um, if it's higher up in the cortex, these are probably still working, but the message may not be going to the place it needs to go. If we're talking about blindness due to retinal damage, these are probably not going to work as intended. Does that help? Yeah. The answer is it depends, as is many things in psychology. All right. So here's kind of an example of how these different cells work. So here we have an on-center ganglion cell. And I've decided to shine a light right here in the center. And you'll notice that when we do a single cell recording, when the light is on, firing increases. Now, I have a quick question. Let's see if you can get this. What? So you can see that I haven't... I haven't filled the entire center. I just did a little spot. What would happen if I filled up the entire center? So if the light was just fitting this perfectly, what would happen? I'd get maximal firing. So you're going to get your best firing when the light fully matches the center. You're still gonna get excitation if you do this tiny little spot, but you'll get even more if you fill it. Now, if I shine a tiny light in the surround, you can see that while that light is on, I get a little bit of inhibition. 
And much like you get maximal excitation when light completely fills the center, you get maximal inhibition when light fully encloses the surround. So now let's see what this ha what happens with an off-center ganglion cell, and you can see the reverse happens. So here, I shine a light in the inhibitory center, and I get inhibition. In the surround, which is excitatory, I shine light in the, uh, uh, the surround, and I get a lot of excitation as a result. So these are basically working in opposite directions. And as I've mentioned, the size of the light matters. So here we have a case of an on-center cell. And here's what I want to show you. Here, we get a little spot of light. It doesn't perfectly cover the center, but we do find it get, you get some excitation from it. I completely fill the center. We get our best response. The light gets bigger. And now it's partially in this. It's mostly in the center, but I've got some in the surround too. Look. It dropped because now I've got some light in the surround, so we have a little bit of inhibition here. And then here, I've got a light that covers the entire thing, and I do get some firing, but not very much because the excitation and inhibition are basically canceling each other out here. So the size of the light matters in addition to where the light is placed. So why this center surround structure? It turns out that it's the ganglion cells, at least in our retina, that are the most sensitive to differences in light intensity, particularly the differences in intensity between the center and the surround. And it turns out that this is the very beginning of us being able to see things like edges, and contours. That's gonna be really critical for us to recognize objects, for us to be able to differentiate between different objects. So for example, right now I'm looking at this side of the classroom and some of you overlap each other. Like those of you that are closer are blocking people that are sitting farther away. Now, if I didn't have an understanding of edges and contours, and if I didn't have these center surround structures, I would not be able to differentiate any one of you from the other. You would all just be like a big, massive blob of students. So we need this because this is the first step for us being able to recognize objects, separate objects from their background, differentiate one object from the other. We need edges and contours for that because one of the things we're gonna talk about probably on Tuesday is that the world is basically made up of fuzzy stripes. For you, and the world has edges, the world has contours. This is how we begin to start to see those. So an example of this are what are known as mock bands. So um, I'm gonna show you an example of mock bands really quick. Can I not see anything about Travis Kelsey for the foreseeable future, please? Sorry, I'm very tired. <laughs> All right, let me look up mock bands. That is, okay, here we go. All right, so here's an example of a mock band. So what you can kind of see here in this figure, I'm gonna blow this up. So mock bands basically kind of work like this. Um, you are looking at light of varying intensities, and one of the things that's kind of interesting is that this edge, so the left edge, is always going to seem darker than the right edge. Part of the reason, you're just going to have to take my word for it, that picture is very small. <laughs> 
But part of the reason that mock bands work the way that they do is because you, you're basically taking advantage of that center surround structure. So here, we have a more simplified version. So here's a darker color, here's a lighter color. And you can see that when you get that boundary between dark and light with these center surround structures, you can see here, we're totally in darkness. We've got a lot of inhibition right here. This receptive field though, traverses a boundary. So that means it's going to be differentially activated compared to something that's totally in dark versus something that's totally in light. This is going to indicate a change between this and this. So we get the most differential excitation when light and dark, when that boundary basically exists. And that's why one side of the mock band looks brighter than the other side of that particular band. Now I have a final word about ganglion cells. So a couple of things that you need to know, and they might pop up on the test. I have a study guide to give you next week because the exam is coming up, not next week, but the week after. Um, so P ganglion cells, remember that P ganglion cells are connected to cones. And those midget bipolar cells really only contact one single cone. So they have small receptive fields. Remember that the more information that you have to integrate, the larger your receptive field. If you're only talking with one cone, that receptive field is going to be really small. So our P ganglion cells, which are based on communication with cones, have small receptive fields. They have high acuity. They work best in high luminance conditions, which is a fancy word for saying they work best in bright light, just like cones do, and they have sustained firing. They notice sameness. They notice constancy. Now compare that to our M ganglion cells, which are largely driven by connections with multiple rods. They have larger receptive fields because they're communicating with more photoreceptors. They're not very detailed and they can't be because you have multiple rods making contact with the same bipolar cell, which is then making contact with an M ganglion cell. If you have a lot of people talking to you, you're not going to have a lot of detail on each of those people. They tend to work best in low light because rods work best in dim light. And they notice change. They notice changes. They engage in what's called burst firing. They only fire when something changes. They do not fire over a sustained period of time, which is part of the reason why P ganglion cells are really critical for object features, like, it, like color or shape. Those are constant. They don't usually change. Compare that to something like a moving object, which is moving over a distance and changing its position over time. You would want burst firing for that because you need to be able to notice the change. All right, so I want you to think about the last time you went to the movies. I can't give you a very good example because the last time I went to see a movie, I went and saw Oppenheimer at like nine o'clock at night. So it was already dark outside when I went and it was dark when I left. How many of you have recently gone to a movie during daylight hours? Okay. And what is your general experience when you walk out of the door of the movie theater after watching a movie, if it's still light outside? What was that, Ari? I was You're like, ah, it's so bright. Right. So we're going to talk a little bit about what are called light adaptation. We're also going to talk about dark adaptation. So how many of you have had this experience along with me? You turn off the lights to go to bed and everything looks super duper dark. But then you wait like maybe 15 minutes and all of a sudden you can see everything. 
That does not necessarily work if you have a black cat, which I used to have, and he had better vision than me in the dark. And I would accidentally trip over him and he had the nerve to get annoyed with me at tripping over him. Well, he should know my eyes better, but we're going to talk about light and dark adaptations. So have you been to the movies during the daytime? Have you ever had to turn off the lights at night? Both of these things concern what we call light adaptation. What do we do when there's too much light? And dark adaptation, what do we do when there's very little light and we need to take advantage of every single photon that we see? So we have a couple of different mechanisms of light adaptation. One of the first things, one of our first gateways is our pupils. Um, usually in bright light, what you can see is that your pupil will restrict to about two millimeters or so. You can try this out if you want later. We kind of did it a little bit at the very beginning of class this semester where I turned on the lights and I turned off the lights so that you could watch your pupil dilate. So in bright conditions, one of the things that we find, you don't need every photon that is available to be able to see properly. So your iris is basically going to restrict your pupil to the point where very few photons can enter. You don't need, in really bright days, you don't need every photon that's there. Now watch what happens when it's dark out. When it's dark, there are very few photons. There's very little light available. Your pupil is going to increase in size thanks to your iris to basically take in every possible photon that there is. It's making itself larger to capture as many photons as possible. So first of all, our pupil and our iris by extension are going to help make sure that we get the photons that we need if it's dark or um, avoid too many photons as you might see in bright lighting conditions. One of the other things that we know that helps contribute to adaptation, especially to bright light, is that after a sustained bright light for a while, so if we're in bright lighting conditions, at some point, your cones are going to become what is called bleached. That means that at some point, they are going to run out of photopigments and they will need to be replaced. So it's part of the reason why when you walk out of the movie theater, at first, that bright light is awful but you very quickly learn to adapt to it because your photoreceptors become bleached and they start to replace those photopigments. And it works conversely uh, with dark adaptation, just in a very different way. So photopigments change over time. The more light that you have in the retina, the more quickly those opsins get used up. So the photopigments are used rapidly, and that explains why you can adapt to light as quickly as you can. When you're in the dark, less light is going to be available, and because of that, the photopigments don't get bleached as easily. That means that there's more photopigment available at that point for you to see as much light as possible. One of the things that I've kind of experienced in the dark is going, wow, the moon's really bright all of a sudden. When you adapt to the darkness, you will see that the moon is probably far brighter than it needs to be. And we do have a full moon tonight, so it'll be very nice and big and bright.
So taking this together, your visual system is going to regulate the amount of light that enters the eye in the first place. So what happens in bright light? And, oh, I'm on annotate, great. Another term for bright light that you're going to occasionally see me use, um, I'm gonna go ahead and put up those controls. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and annotate. So another term that you will occasionally hear for bright light is called photopic. So photopic is bright light. I can't spell. Scotopic is dim light. And if you want a middle of those, so something that's kind of in the middle is mesopic. So when we are in photopic lighting conditions, the pupil is going to restrict to basically gatekeep how many photo photons are entering the eye. And additionally, the number of photopigments is going to decrease very quickly so that you can adapt to bright lighting conditions. And because we are doing this gatekeeping through our pupil, and because the photopigments are very rapidly being used up, that means that any leftover photons that we didn't catch are not processed. They're basically thrown out. They don't get processed. I see a few people writing, so I'm gonna wait just a second. Okay. I've, you need a little more time, Lauren? Okay. All right. So we're going to go ahead and clear that. No, I don't need annotations anymore. We're good. All right. So here you can actually see, so I mentioned that rods tend to work best in dim light and cones tend to work best in bright light. So what you're basically looking at, um, when we go from uh, scotopic to mesopic to photopic, we start shifting from rod-driven vision into cone-driven vision. Um, so in scotopic conditions, when we're in dim light, we are almost entirely dependent upon rods. How many of you are like me and you have a lot of trouble driving in that blue period right after sunset? That is one of the worst times to drive because you can't, everything looks blue. Nothing looks like a different color. And in fact, in the dark, it's really hard to see color because we are largely operating on rods. But here's the problem. So here we're looking at luminance. We're looking at luminance on our x-axis and on our y-axis, we're looking at contrast. So one of the things you'll see is that basically rods only work in scotopic conditions and they saturate pretty quickly. So above, above dim light, they're a little useless. Now, if we get into mesopic condition, an example would be maybe looking at the full moon or reading light or reading light. In mesopic conditions, we're gonna start to shift over from rod driven vision into cone driven vision. And then we're gonna get into photopic conditions. So if we're talking about perfect sunlight or daylight shade, we're getting peak contrast and we're gonna very quickly start getting saturation from those cones. So it's part of the reason why in poor lighting conditions, it's really hard to differentiate color. But in the dark, so this was light adaptation. The rods max out pretty quick. And as we get into brighter conditions, the cones take over and begin to max out. But let's say that we're doing the opposite. We're starting in the light and we're going into the dark. So we're going into the movie theater, for example. So here, again, we have our threshold intensity on our Y axis. We have time in the dark in minutes. 
you can see that right here in those very initially when we're in the dark, we're still moving based on cone driven vision. We were in the light, we turned off the lights and now enough, and now we can't see anything. So the cones are basically still responding when you're initially in the dark, but they're not very sensitive and they're basically going to max out. They can't do their job when it's too dark. And at that point, the cones will begin to take over about 10 minutes or the rods will take over about 10 minutes in. And that's going to enable us to see in the dark better. Rods are going to be a lot more sensitive because they don't fire as intensely in dark lighting conditions. So now let's finish up by talking about some disorders of the retina. So I want to start by talking about macular degeneration, which you've heard me talk about before. Um, so I also want to share some risk factors. Um, macular degeneration can be really debilitating. So I think it's worth knowing about. So some of the risk factors for uh, macular degeneration, um, the most common ones, first of all, being 50 and older. So thankfully nobody's there yet. Um, smoking, having high blood pressure and eating a diet that's higher in a uh, saturated fat. So there are age related mac there is age related macular degeneration. Um, additionally, um, if you have a family history, that's going to play a role. Prolonged sun exposure is going to play a role. Um, a as I mentioned, age. Um, interestingly enough, I did not know this. If you are female, you actually have a greater risk. That could be partially because in general. Um, women tend to live longer. Um, in terms of race, if, if you are white, you are more likely to get this. Um, additionally, uh, diet, if you have high fat, high cholesterol, high glycemic index foods, low in antioxidants, those are going to up your risk. Now, this is one I know very well. Blue-eyed, gray-eyed, green-eyed people, my light-eyed colored folks, you're more likely to develop it. And that's partially because you just have less melanin to provide that protection in your eye. Um, so it's there's less protection from UV rays. So macular degeneration, um, it's not a lot of fun. I kind of mentioned my grandfather kind of struggled with it later on in his life. Um, which meant that he really couldn't see anything in his centermost vision. Remember that your macula is your fovea. That is where your best vision is. So your sharp central vision will get worse with age if you have macular degeneration. Macular degeneration. And what you're going to see is that that macula can uh, degrade over time. So here's what it would normally look like. Here is what is called a wet macular degeneration. Here is what is called a dry macular degeneration. So let me look up the difference between those two for those who are curious. Okay, so wet age-related macular degeneration. This is a case where abnormal blood vessels form in the eye and they leak proteins. Ew. Uh, dry does not involve abnormal uh, blood vessels. Dry macular degeneration uh, is more common and it does tend to be a little bit less severe. But one of the major symptoms of age-related macular degeneration is you're basically going to develop blindness or a hole in your center most vision, which is referred to as a scotoma. So let me show you what kind of a scotoma looks like. So it would kind of look a little bit like this. So here's what somebody would see 
if they were kind of looking at this building, if they didn't have macular degeneration, here's what a scotoma basically looks like. So you can see why this would be incredibly debilitating, right? Like this isn't your periphery. You could prop losing your periphery is not a, not great, but it seems like losing your centermost vision is going to be a lot more debilitating than losing your periphery. And in fact, my grandfather was for all intents and purposes in his later years because of this effectively blind, which meant definitely not going to be able to drive with this. Definitely not. Okay. So that's macular degeneration. Here's another example of what it looks like. You can see again why this would be really debilitating. So this is how it would look with normal vision. Here's what it looks like with macular degeneration. And then we're gonna talk about something called retinitis pigmentosa. So retinitis pigmentosa is actually almost kind of the reverse of age-related macular degeneration. This is a hereditary disease. So if this doesn't run in your family, odds are very unlikely that you are to get it. Um, this is a case where the pigment epithelium becomes damaged. Remember that I mentioned on Tuesday that the pigment epithelium is the main source of nutrition for our photoreceptors. If you damage the pigment epithelium, you are going to kill the photoreceptors. And in retinitis pigmentosa, that is what typically happens. So you get the progressive death and loss of photoreceptors and the pigment epithelium becomes more damaged and the ability for it to give nutrition to the photoreceptors is likewise damaged. So here, you're looking at an image of the retina. Here's what it looks like without retinitis pigmentosa. Part of the reason that we call it retinitis pigmentosa is that you can see uh, that there's just pigmentation just popping up in the retina. It looks like your retina has freckles. Your retina should not have freckles. Um, additionally, a couple of other things that you'll notice, uh, the optic disc, where the optic nerve leaves the eye, notice that it looks a little pale. And you will also see that the blood vessels, they're not very sharp. They're very, very thin. Um, so this is initially going to affect the periphery because that's where mo more of the photoreceptors are. Remember, you have more rods than you do cones. And where do the rods tend to reside? In the periphery. So initially, this is going to lead to uh, damage in the peripheral vision, which I got to say, if you have to choose between your periphery and your center vision, lose your periphery. This is still incredibly debilitating, though. And because we are talking about the progressive death of photoreceptors, it's very easy to see that while the periphery is going to be damaged first, this is not where it's going to end. At some point, you can probably expect that over time with progressive loss, your centermost vision will also negatively be affected. So let me see if I can share some risk factors for retinitis pigmentosa. It almost looked up retinal detachment risk factors. I'm like, I already know that. I have the small chance that mine could randomly detach someday. That's why you go to the eye doctor every year. They give you a heads up if things like that might happen. Um, some of the different risk factors for uh, retinitis pigmentosa, um, being male, so it's kind of the reverse of um, macular degeneration, and family history. Um, can it be prevented? There is no specific treatment, but again, this is a case where much like macular degeneration, protecting your eyes with from UV rays with sunglasses, um, with glasses that have UV blocking rays, that can really help as well. Um, interestingly enough, an artificial retina has been developed for individuals with very advanced disease and severe vision loss. Odds are pretty good. That's probably going to be more likely to be a treatment for a variety of eye diseases in the future. So here is what you might expect with retinitis pigmentosa. 
here's the normal view. And basically you get old timey movie, Iris out. <laughs> So how do we treat different types of retinal disorders? Um, as I kind of mentioned, prosthetic retinas are starting to become more common. Uh, you basically are taking the damaged photoreceptors and replacing them with an implant. Uh, you can do gene therapy. Basically, you would try to do that to improve the function of the photoreceptors that are still hanging on basically enhance their abilities to make up for what you're lacking. And with chemical therapy, this, this one sounds really interesting. You basically take a ganglion cell and you turn it into a photoreceptor. So here's an example of what that implant might look like. So here uh, we have an image. This is obviously going to have to be implanted on the uh, near the retina. This is called an epiretinal implant. So here are the ganglion cells. So you're going to have two different spots. The implants right here. Here you have the subretinal implant that's right between the uh, photoreceptors, and you're basically going to use that to make up for these photoreceptors that have been destroyed due to diseases. So it's basically going to have that subretinal implant acting as a functional set of photoreceptors for that epiretinal implant. Kind of cool. We're all going to be technologically advanced Marvel someday. We're going to be bionic people. Well, we've still got like seven minutes left, so we might as well talk about what happens when information leaves the retina and it moves to the brain. And I did post these for you yesterday. I kind of got on a roll. So we're going to talk a little bit more about going to the eye doctor. <laughs> and I made these really pretty. Ah. Can you move? I had floating meeting controls. We're going to change that to duplicate. There we go. That's better. I'm going to be seeing that pretty soon. <laughs> so here's kind of our overview. We're going to talk about visual acuity, and we're going to talk about the visual pathway. So we're now moving into chapter three. Your quiz, by the way, that posts on Friday at midnight and is due Tuesday at five is on chapter two. Um, so we're gonna talk about visual acuity. We're gonna talk about the different types of acuity. And if you wanna hear a lot of talk about sine waves, oh boy, is this the lecture for you. <laughs> um, the visual pathway, we're gonna talk about the retinal ganglion cells and what they do when they leave the optic nerve. We're gonna in particular focus on the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. And we're gonna talk about the striate cortex, which is better known as the primary visual cortex. That's what this lecture is gonna focus on. Okay, so we're gonna start by talking about the beginnings of visual acuity. I love that the designer just knew what I was wanting and was like, here's some glasses and some letters for you to look at. Very good. Okay, so before we start anywhere else, we do have to talk a little bit about the visual pathway. So the visual pathway kind of works like this. So here's your retina. One of the things that I didn't quite talk about is that your retina is divided into two halves. So you have what is called a temporal retina. We call it temporal because it's right by your temples and the temporal lobe. And then we have your inner half, which are called your nasal retinas. They are right near your nose. So your optic nerve is going to leave the eye we're gonna hit a place called the optic chiasm. You can actually find an optic chiasm on 
um, on a brain, if you're looking at a ventral view, you should be able to see an X. That X is the optic chiasm. The optic chiasm at that place, the nasal retinas cross over. So notice that here's our nasal retina from the left eye. Here's our nasal retina from the right eye. They're gonna completely cross over. And once we get past the optic chiasm, we are now in the central nervous system. So we're gonna call it the optic tract. Groups of axons in the central nervous system are referred to as tracts. If they're in the peripheral nervous system, they're called nerves. At this point, we're in the brain, we're gonna call it a tract. And one other thing that I will mention, at this point, after the optic chiasm, this side of the brain, the left side of the brain, is responsible for the right visual field. At this point, the right side of the brain is responsible for the left visual field. So once we get past the chiasm, everything is contralateral. Left side of the brain for right visual space, right side of the brain for left visual space. Um, and then the optic tract is gonna make contact with the thalamus at the lateral geniculate nucleus. It's going to form what are called optic radiations that are gonna be responsible for the upper and lower parts of the visual field. And it's gonna make contact with the primary visual cortex right at the back of the brain. And then for your visual uh, orientation, here's our primary visual cortex. Sometimes it is called the striate cortex. We'll talk about why it's called the striate cortex later. And then we have other areas of the visual cortex and higher order areas that are responsible for things like color, shape, motion processing, object recognition, and so on. We're going to go ahead and stop here. I'm going to start with this figure. We're going to talk more about the magnocellular and parvocellular pathways. And I will see you all here next time. Have a great weekend. Don't forget your quiz. And have a really great